Yeah, I, I arrived. I spent several days last Thursday getting to New Zealand. Yeah. Um, I got here on Friday and um, staying with Tom and um, did a lecture. What day is it? Today's Tuesday. I, I, give I think a, so. Yes, well, I'm <laughs> never entirely certain when I travel. I did a faculty uh, workshop yesterday and gave a lecture and uh, I'm with you today. And tomorrow I do the Shakespeare talk and I spend Thursday getting back to New York. Well, I can hear us in our headphones, which means we are live. Good. Now, look, I, I know you've just said, oh, call me Bill, call me Bill, which yeah. is what we'll do. But I think the pr correct and proper thing to do is to give you your official title to start with. Okay. Professor Dr. William Germano. That's very German, but yes, putting all those, putting all those. I've always uh, wondered, do you do <laughs> Professor Doctor or do you do Dr. Professor? Is there a, is there I a always get it mixed up in Germany um, and they're very serious about these things. I would assume you go professor first and uh, then doctor. Yeah, well, I think I think the official. I've, I've known a few professor doctors, and I think it's professor doctor yeah. because doctor is a part of your actual name. I see. And then a professor is like a professional courtesy. <laughs> I think so. Uh. Your boarding pass on your air, the airline ticket will say doctor. Won't say professor doctor. It does not get you a better seat on a yeah. plane. I and can then tell you, you that. oh really? No, I thought that's well, the only I'm reason. Afraid. That's like a knighthood. And you used to get a knighthood in the Commonwealth, and you could ride a horse across a certain bridge. A friend of carrying a, your <coughs> sword, carrying a sword. A friend, a, friend a, a friend of mine's a reverend, and his name's Christopher. And the airline boarding pass gets shortened, so his boarding pass says Reverend Christ. Oh, there you go. Oh, reverend that Christ. must get you in great. I, I, We'd want him near the front of the plane. I think that's probably right. <laughs> so, hey, thank you so much for coming in, Bill. Very happy to be here. Um, I, I, I was intrigued. I keep my eye on what's happening at the university here in Dunedin pretty heavily because, like yourself, there are always an, a vast array of interesting people coming through. Um, I love Shakespeare, always have, enjoy it in all its forms, including things like, and hopefully we'll talk a bit about this, about the, you know, the adaptations to film that aren't obvious, like 10 Things I Hate About You, mm -hmm. these sorts of things that they get used in there. Well, not obvious unless you know. You know when you know it's there, you see it there. Um, your speech, your lecture in Dunedin looks like it's going to be about an element of Shakespeare that I'd never really thought of, thought through. Um, not that I'm the, the 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 answer to Shakespeare, but um, which is the the links to Shakespeare, Shakespeare and opera, the operatic nature of Shakespeare. Are you talking in a literal sense to the opera, or are you talking about the flows and rhythms of Shakespeare, or? Or what? That's a good question. Um, there are hundreds of operas that have been based on Shakespeare, um, depending on how you count, between 300 and 400. Um, since the 18th century, there are a lot. The Part of the difficulty is knowing what counts as an opera that's based on Shakespeare. So if somebody has two young lovers and their Star parents don't lovers. agree yeah, yeah, and yeah. they're dead at the end is it based on Shakespeare it may be but it may also be based on some very terrible European drama right which may possibly have been based on Shakespeare sometimes the operas that are quote Shakespeare operas aren't based on Shakespeare but on Shakespeare's sources so they could have leapfrogged back to the texts that Shakespeare was working with or right. based his plays on. So figuring out what actually counts is very hard. Um, there are only a few operas that are in the standard repertory in opera houses that can say, well, this is based on Shakespeare. Some of them are, again, are based on things that may be suggested by Shakespeare. So it's sort of Shakespeare at two removes. Sometimes it's Shakespeare at three removes. Um, so I'll be talking a bit about that, and uh, to, to pick up on the point you were making, I'll talk a little bit about <coughs> what it is in Shakespeare's own writing that makes it possible for composers to say, yeah, I can, I can do something with this, other than well, I admire Shakespeare, Shakespeare is great. Um, so those are some of the problems that I'm going to touch on in the talk tomorrow. I should, I should announce when that talk is. Yeah, people I, are picking I'll, this I'll, up I'll, live. Be, I'll be a good fellow about this. The talk is at 5.30 tomorrow afternoon, September the 18th, and it's in the Richardson Building on the 10th floor, Moot Court on campus. Nice. And I'm sure at some stage we'll bring up the, we always throw it out there. Well, there you go. Just like that. There, there you go. You, there you go. There's my smiling face so when you say there's only a, a few uh, i'm paraphrasing back to you what you've just said that there's only a small amount of, of operas that you can make a distinct and direct line to shakespeare are you saying like someone has turned hamlet into an opera that close the connection there are a lot there are actually uh quite a number of operas based on hamlet yeah um the one of the very best um 
is by um, an uh, Australian composer, um, um, and that work by Brett Dean was done, I think, three years ago at Glyndebourne in England, and it's on video. I think it's coming to New York to the Metropolitan Opera House in the next season or two. It's terrific. There is a famous French opera by Ambroise Thomas called Hamlet. It's a little strange. <laughs> um, it's in French, and um, it's occasionally done. I've seen it a few times. The the one. So, but, but is that so? It, you said based on Hamlet, but that one's called Hamlet. Is that actually Hamlet? done an opera is it still an interpretation of Hamlet would you recognize it as Hamlet you would because it's Hamlet there's an Ophelia right there's a king there's a queen bad things happen people die what you look forward to when you see Hamlet <laughs> uh, except it's in French and it's sung and of course the text is cut way way back yeah of course and it needs to be translated into not only into French because it was done by a French composer for a French audience but it's got to be singable language, and that's one of the difficulties with Shakespeare. Not only is there a lot of text, it's complicated text, and it's not text that you can just pick up and say, oh yeah, I can set those words to music the way they are. There are too many words, it's too complicated. So you, you've got to be very patient with a Shakespeare opera. You have to say, okay, I know how hard it must have been, and now let me see what the librettists have done to make it possible to create a text that can be set. The ones I really like, though, are the ones that nobody knows, and these are the 18th century operas that are based on Shakespeare, uh, based on, well, I call them Shakespeare operas, but they're deliberately not based on Shakespeare. They're based on Shakespeare's sources. So you get a Hamlet that's from the early 18th century that's not based on Shakespeare, but based on the Danish sources for Shakespeare's mm -hmm. Hamlet. So the plot seems entirely crazy, and the characters' names are different. Um, but they're still bloody. People still die. Um, it's not quite as as much fun, I think, as as the the later the later operas that are based on uh, more closely based on uh, Shakespeare's plays. I, I'm going to show my um, how uh, uneducated I am with um, <laughs> things, and, and and go the only Hamlet I know is uh, is from Netflix or from from TV, and that's the um, the show. Have you ever seen the show um, Sons of Anarchy? Yeah. Yeah. So Sons of Anarchy is Hamlet. Um, I didn't see. I didn't know that. I love Sons of Anarchy. Yeah, Sons so Sons of Anarchy. Anarchy. So so Jax is Hamlet oh. um, because his father is killed by his uncle, and the queen is is the is the, um, the matriarch. Yeah, Piggy, is, is Piggy, Piggy Bundy. Bundy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's actually a very, as from what I can tell, it's a relatively close telling. It's very very. It's not loosely based on Hamlet. It's like all of the characters in Hamlet are actually in the in the That's show. That's really interesting because because you talk about the interpretation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know Hamlet well enough. Um, I didn't pick up on that. So that doesn't that then go to speak that these are also just very commonly told storylines? Like, I think we've said this before on the podcast. I'm pretty sure John Cleese said the reason they made 14 uh, Faulty Towers is there's kind of 14 <laughs> storylines. Every story oh, in the world great. That's great. will fit into one of 14 storylines. And so he's like, so we were done. Now, we could probably look that up. I've said that twice now. If I'm wrong, I'm happy to retract. But I'm pretty sure I've heard him say that. And so when you see something that is inspired by, uh, you know, comes from the, a Hamlet source or a Romeo and Juliet, yeah, like Star-Crossed Lovers, how, right. many, how, many, how many stories have Star-Crossed Lovers that aren't seeing Romeo and Juliet as their basis? That's, I think it's a good point because we like to think that uh, there are... Um, so almost endless variations on something like Romeo and Juliet. Shakespeare is working with materials, but he gave it a shape that had tremendous um, influence. Something like West Side Story, for mm, example, yeah, totally. is is Romeo and Juliet, and something like The Lion King is vague. It's ha it's a Hamlet ish. Mm. Um, there are so many variants, and you you can easily do. Um, uh, what Jason was doing is looking at um, a contemporary film and saying, wait a minute, that plot, I can see how that plot connects yeah, to like, Shakespeare. Yeah, like which way is it? Are we looking at it uh, in hindsight saying, hey, that works? Or are the makers of the product fitting it to make it actually be that? Yeah, I well, think with that one, it was definitely like, they, uh, I think the writers, yeah, they were, it, was, it wasn't like, oh, you can kind of, if you look at it in this lens, it's <laughs> Hamlet. It was very directly like there is like it's quite literal 
it's it, you know I haven't actually read Hamlet myself, but I the basic understanding by looking at Wikipedia is you know there was a father. The father's killed by the brother because he want he fall he wants to sleep, he wants to be with the queen. Um, and the queen and the the, the queen. For, well, this is me going off the storyline of Sons of Anarchy. The queen, <laughs> the queen and the uncle want to be together, and so the father's killed, and then the 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 son is haunted by the father's ghost who brings some messages. And what in Sons of Anarchy, what happens? If you, you might not be familiar with it, but Sons of Anarchy, um, the, the the main protagonist um, finds um, a book, a diary of his father. Yeah, and so that's it's right. All these thoughts and what the father wanted to happen with this motorcycle gang that they were in. And so he's basically spends a lot of time reading it, and it's the and he the internal voice um, is is his father's voice, and so mm. it's, it's it's a literal. It's rather than it being a ghost, it's thoughts from beyond the grave of his father in the form of this book, and so I think it's quite a literal yeah. Hamlet translation. So it's it's, it's so funny. Shakespeare, of course, forgot to put the motorcycles into the play, <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, but I think what happens in these in these plays, particularly in the great plays, plays like. Romeo and Juliet and um, The Tempest and Hamlet is that the stories that Shakespeare put together um, seem to like seem like myths to us. They seem like the myths, uh, the Greek myths, as if they are uh, they've always been there and that they're capable of generating story after story. Every generation invents its own version of these stories, which is I don't think damages Shakespeare at all. Shakespeare's plays are still there, yeah. and they need to be interpreted and performed. But these adaptations, you mentioned Sons of Anarchy, I mentioned West Side Story, there are, it's an endless, um, there are an endless number of ways in which these, uh, content, these powerful tales, they continue to act upon us with, with, a, with a great sense of power. In fact, in the 19th century, People um, who were reading uh, Shakespeare, particularly in, um, I'm thinking in particular of uh, the, the Italians who were reading Shakespeare and writing libretti for op for composers to set, saw in Shakespeare, in Hamlet in particular, the story of Oedipus. Right. So we're like leapfrogging back from the from 1600 uh, to ancient Greece and and in a sense I think that just confirms that Shakespeare got it so right that people saw sort of an endless an endless uh, kind of source uh, for storytelling and we all know that myths myths are the things that live on and they get reinterpreted all the time um, if you would have um, if you would have Think about Shakespeare, like taking a step back from the interpretations. If you were to start someone on Shakespeare, like there are so many people who kind of go, who, who push Shakespeare right, aside. Right. I can't understand the language. I can't do this kind of thing. Where would you, where would you point someone towards if they were going to start, like that you'd be hoping that they'd catch a glimpse and find some enjoyment from Shakespeare? Would you point them to the text? Would you point them to like a movie of the text, or would you talk them to an, an interpretation of the text? Where would you point them? That's a good. That's a good question. I th it would depend. I think I'd probably have a chat with the person first to figure out what they were interested in. You know, if you were if you were coming, if you were bringing a young person to Shakespeare, I might start, and they had never read any before. I might bring something very powerful and with a lot of emotional force, like Romeo and Juliet. It's very sad. Um, a lot of people would say The Tempest mm. because The Tempest gives you a chance to talk about so many different kinds of things, including um, including coming of age, which is what happens with the young people, um, but also The Outsider. Um, it's, a, it's, been, it's a favorite play with which to teach about what it means to be um, enslaved, what it means to be thought of as monstrous, um, what it means not to have any power. And uh, this is Caliban, the, the sort of monstrous figure um, who is uh, uh, the antagonist for um, Prospero in Tempest. But I might also just say, you know, let's just let's just go see a performance live to see what it's like mm. to watch actors really engaging with a play. 
Some people might say, I'd like to see a movie that gives me some sense of what Shakespeare is like. And there, there's so many really uh, good um, films of Shakespeare's plays. I'm, and I'm not, I don't spend a lot of time myself because I, I go to a lot of live theater. Yep. So I don't spend a lot of time actually with, with recorded perform with uh, recorded performances, um, but there are there are great things out there. I thought the question you were going to ask me was where I where would I start um, somebody on a on a Shakespeare reading. That's a much better question than what I was. Well, going that's to ask. right. So no, just... I mean two plays that I'd like to put together. Uh, one is the bloodiest and most horrifying play that Shakespeare wrote, Titus Andronicus. It's an early play. I think that there's something like eleven or thirteen deaths, and there are. There are beheadings. People get their hands cut off. There is sexual violence. There is sacrifice. There is uh, every horrific thing that can be done by one person to another happens in this play. It sounds like um, Game of Thrones fans. Were <laughs> exactly. You no, know, it's exactly right. So, and and that play, I've when I teach in my Shakespeare class, I often start with that play because students have not read it. Right. And uh, you want some unfamiliarity. You don't want students to say, oh, yeah, I read Hamlet in high school. Oh, yeah, Macbeth. That's the Scottish one. Right? I'm not going to. I read it. I used to work with a colleague who would say that our students, um, our students treat Shakespeare like uh, childhood disease. If you caught Othello in high school, you can't catch it again when you're in college. Um, so I'd like to begin with that. And then I'd like to teach a play that I love, Midsummer Night's Dream, which is pretty close in terms of composition time. So you're watching Shakespeare produce this monstrous, horrific tragedy of yeah. ancient Rome. And then this exquisite lyrical sort of meditation on what it means to fall in love. Um, and weirdly, there are, it's, both plays have a character named Demetrius, which my students think is hysterical. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we talk about the two plays and how somebody could possibly have an imagination to be able to hold those two things together, and yes, you're saying, and, and just produce them in a short period of yeah, time. Yeah, but they, they they were produced next to each other. Well, pretty uh, yeah. uh, not that far. Within Kui, as they say. <laughs> in Kui, within Kui of each other. I see. Is that not? A, is that New not Zealand? A, that's that's New Zealand. Zealand. No, no, you, you've lost me on this. Within, one. I don't even know what that means. Within Kui means close to each other. Oh, I see. Yeah. In Kui. Okay. So <laughs> I'll take that slang. home. I'll, I'll take that home and use it. Entomology of within Kui. See what comes up. Um. I also wonder, Baz Luhrmann, I think, probably did a, a great service to Shakespeare amongst maybe my generation or a bit younger when he came out with his Romeo and Juliet with Claire Danes and Leonardo DiCaprio because everybody loved it. And they straight away saw Shakespeare in a different yeah. light. Funny, I was just talking to my sister as I was driving in here and she went to the pop-up in Auckland, a Globe Theatre, recently and we were talking about it and I still, I still remember vividly seeing Shakespeare done um, authentically to the script mm. but interpreted in a modern way and the two examples that I always think of is I think it's one of the Capulets anyway one of the fathers when he's in his limo he talks about reaching for his sword and he reaches up to the corner of the limo and there's a gun there but they zoom in on it and the brand name the maker of the gun is sword that's so clever I know that's and then the so other one is, is that famous scene where they're doing archery in Romeo and Juliet and in the film they're playing pool so yeah. all of the dialogue yeah. fits Perfectly, I, think, I just I thought think we, it was yeah, genius. I think we studied, I think we studied the, the Baz Luhrmann, and I think the English teacher pointed out the whole like you know they showed a clip of you know the nine millimeter in the air, the sword on the side. Yeah, because you know like having a film where it wasn't a yeah as you say like as, as the script wasn't taken into modern text. They literally verbatim took the took the original um, play's um, script yeah. and just put it into a modern context without changing the words. Yeah. yeah, and of course having low rider, you know, 60s muscle cars and stuff certainly help. But I just, I, I do wonder, you get that, because that was really a cultural phenomenon. It must have been, what, mid to late 90s, 96, 97, something like that? Something like that. So I was in my 20s, uh, you know, and a whole group of people who had nothing to do with yeah. Shakespeare caught it. Partly, you know, because there was, for the girls, there was Leah, and, the, and for the boys, there was Claire Danes, and this as well as a part of it. Um, gosh, I remember... For probably five years around that movie, I remember organising a, a ball, like um, you know, for five hundred people, and the theme was Romeo and Juliet, and it was because of the movie, not because of the text right, per se. Right, so right. I think things like that come along and they ignite a whole, whole new generation of people to come along and say, "Who's this dude? What's he all about?" Am I allowed to say, "Dude" with Shakespeare? <laughs> probably not. 
<laughs> we, we, we <laughs> it was ha- this bad. Yeah, we, we had uh, when I, when I was young, we had there was a Franco Zeffirelli made a, a famous um, adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, which I mean everyone swooned over. It. Everybody was beautiful. It was beautifully designed. It was beautifully photographed. It had a nice score, um, and it, it became a certain kind of uh, lush, romantic, tragic way mm-hmm. of showing people what Romeo and Juliet could be about. But there are so many versions of Romeo and Juliet. I know there's a one that I've seen, and I'm, I'm going to blank on the name. It's an all-male Romeo and Juliet. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's an all-male Romeo and Juliet set, and I think in a boys' school. Um, oh. and, and there are lots and lots of different different ways in which that story it, it, it's and do a, they still play a romantic relationship amongst yeah them? between the two oh, of them and it's very it's very it, it, they understand what's what's dangerous about that yeah um and uh but there are so so many 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 versions the ones that i i don't know that i'll have a chance to talk about this tomorrow uh is um an 18th century uh, Romeo and Juliet opera in which Romeo and Juliet don't die. So we get oh. them. We get them in the the the, the famous last scene. Yep. Um, I don't. I think it may be in a bedroom. I'm not quite sure. I can't remember whether it's in bedroom or whether it's in a tomb or in a family chapel. And um, uh, Juliet uh, and Romeo, I think, are both there. Um, and the parents come in and they are just weeping horribly and the friar or whoever the other per- the, the the minister is says uh, this is terrible and the father says something like oh if I only knew I would never have if I only knew it would come to this I never would have stood in the way right. at which point the kids get up and they say dad <laughs> and he, everyone's very happy and they sing a, a happy conclusion to the opera and there's no tragedy um hey <laughs> something, something like that, but in german but in german in other words that but with leather pants on <laughs> and david hasselhoff, <laughs> and david hasselhoff. And david hasselhoff. That, that is a completely terrifying idea <laughs> david hasselhoff music or david hasselhoff playing something um, or david hasselhoff in the, i think just pants. yes just yes <laughs> yes to all just yes yes to all the above <laughs> that's fascinating though because i mean straight away I'm both intrigued with what that is and shocked and going, hang on, you can't, yeah. you can't change. No, right. that's not, right. that's missing a, it's like they talk about comedy being tragedy plus time. Um, co- you know, using comedy as just tragedy, not allowing it for the time. There's something wrong with that. That finish, there's something that doesn't feel right. There's a, there, there's a long tradition of, of, of messing up the endings to tragedies. Right. It's not only in, on the opera stage. Um, um, some English audiences were really uncomfortable with the tragic finales of Shakespeare's tragedies and sometimes you had to have a finale in which a staging of production in which the characters did not die. Right. In the 18th century, I mean in the 19th century, the, uh, there was a French opera, a French opera of Hamlet, the one I mentioned earlier, was um, planned, uh, I think in, in the original version, Hamlet does not die. Okay. And he becomes the king after Claudius is is, is out of the way. Uh, but the composer wanted the production done in London and thought, well, the English will never put up with this. Yeah. So we rewrote the end so Hamlet dies. I think the production did not ever then come to London, but it exists uh, as the London version. And these days when the opera is done, Hamlet has to die because otherwise the audience would just fall about with laughter. Yeah, they'll be like, what have, what have we just seen you know, here? Yeah, because we, we, we paid to see Hamlet die. <laughs> we did not pay for seeing we were Hamlet into blood be happy sports. at the end. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> um, when I saw you were coming to Dunedin, this might, I'm going to sound like a bit of a Philistine here, so please bear with me. <laughs> when I finally connected with you and we ended up you know, agreeing to catch up, I went and I watched a movie which a lot of people who are Shakespeare purists turn their nose up at. But I love, and that's the, I think it's Ralph Fiennes, isn't it? Ralph Fiennes, Gwyneth Paltrow, Shakespeare in Love. Yeah. And the reason I love it is exactly what you were talking about before, which was the origins of Shakespeare's writing. I love watching that Fiennes character go through the street and hearing an argument over his shoulder, a pox on both your houses, and you see him going, oh, you know, jotting it down. That's an inspiration for a line. And there's another one where he hears um, someone talking about, you know, a rose by any other name. And I love that someone's come along and gone, how would Shakespeare write this play? Right. 
and seeing him be influenced by the world around him and hearing a line there and having a character called Rosaline and, you know, like that he knew um, and, and, you know, promising to write her a great part and then she broke his heart and that didn't end up so well for him in the play. Um, and then also seeing parts of Romeo and Juliet be acted out supposedly for the first time. I don't know. There's just something about that which I really like and I really like... I, I'm, I'm very much a person who likes watching the creative process. I like watching documentaries on how albums are made. I know there's a, a documentary on how South Park's made called Six Days to Air. I really <laughs> like them because they show the creative process. And when I watch that movie, it makes me feel like I'm watching the Shakespearean creative process. And I, I, I think it's a great way also to get into the space of what is Shakespeare, what are his plays, what was he like, even though it's completely fictional. I love it. Well, um, so confession, I really enjoy the film. Yay! Uh, a lot. I don't really have. I don't really have conversations about this film with with my Shakespearean superiors no, because I thought I don't think that'll end well. But um, and and that's that's not Ray Fiennes. It's Joseph, his younger Joseph his younger Fiennes, brother, okay. his younger brother. And it's written by Tom Stoppard. Mm-hmm. So it's it's incredibly clever film. Um, and the more you know about the period, the more little in jokes are in there. There's a there's a little boy in the around the globe theater who I think is killing rats. And he's a writer, right? Right, right. right. It's John Webster, yeah, yeah, yeah. who is has one of the darkest imaginations of uh, of uh, of the theater of the period. But I. I think the film is it's pure fantasy yes um and it's lovely to imagine that um uh he begins a play about a pirate queen and then turns into this other (laughs) has to have a dog right right exactly has to have a dog has to have a dog uh i love the idea of judy dench as queen elizabeth sort of showing up in disguise in the theater this would not have happened um in fact you go through it moment by moment and say, no, it couldn't have happened, but it's so much fun to yeah. look at it and see what's happening here. I wonder as well, you would use the word fun. I, I, I like, I, I agree with you. I like what you're saying. And I wonder if there's sometimes, you talk about the childhood disease, sometimes people think of Shakespeare as hard work, yeah. a drudge. You know, first of all, I have to actually learn a new language before I even get to understand what this book is all about. Right. Um, yeah, and... and Things like that and things like the Baz Luhrmann uh, adaptation, they do, even though that's true to the script, um, they seem to bring a lightness to it, a, a fun to it, a, a, a different way of doing it that will bring on board a new generation perhaps. So, um, so the confession part of this uh, conversation, Shakespeare's always hard. Yeah. You can, be, you can have worked on Shakespeare for 50 years it's always hard. And why is it hard? It's because it was written 400 years yeah. ago. It wasn't written by people down the street or even the most brilliant writers today. There's language we don't use. Yeah. It's poetry, so it's compressed language. It's trying to do something that you can't simply do by simply uh, saying something straightforward. Um, <clears throat> there were lots of references that very hard to explain um or they're not not intuitive is really what i mean so all the history plays really require some homework for you to make sense of them you can go see henry v and be excited by the great speeches but it's it's a better experience if you've had somebody give you the history background so you go in there say who is richard the third why do i have to care about richard the second's problems who was King John? Why is that? Why, why is there no Magna Carta being signed? That's all I remember about King John. It's not in the play. So um, the uh, the difficulty of Shakespeare is something everybody lives with, and um, the the comedies uh, the comedies are just really really good the great comedies are, are really wonderful and and frankly even some of the lesser comedies are sometimes among the easiest things to stage i saw a production at the globe theater in london earlier this year of the merry wives of windsor which is not one of shakespeare's great plays um but it was so much fun mm-hmm. and um my wife and I each have seen productions of this play that's almost always updated. There was a famous production of the play that was set, I think, in a 50s beauty salon where the merry wives were all 
sitting under hair dryers, having <laughs> having their hair set, and having this conversation about this this outrageous man who had sent the same love letter to two of them. Um, so the comedies give a, give you a lot of free reign. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, um, you know, theater is so different from film. You film, we expect things to be vivid, complete, move, lots of move editing, quick, move, move quickly, quickly. Yeah, absolutely yeah. move quickly. We want stuff to look at. Yeah. We go into the theater, sometimes the most effective production of a Shakespeare play has nothing on, on the stage but the actor and a couple of pieces of furniture, and everything happens in your imagination. Yeah. Um, Peter Brook, who's now well into his 90s, one of the great theater directors of the 20th and, let's say, also the 21st century, did a famous production in the ni- about 1970 of A Midsummer Night's Dream. People like Patrick Stewart were in it wow. before he became the Patrick Stewart we know. Um, and The Midsummer Night's Dream is basically swings and everybody in white. Um, uh, I think a red nose for the... Uh, um, the the actor the character who plays bottom um it was a it was a revolutionary production because there wasn't there weren't any uh, adorable uh, um sort of, sort of school children in little costumes as fairies and and there weren't uh, um people dressed in, in but, but in that means Greek all, all there is is the is the words all there is yeah. so that's the script and nothing else so it has to hang on that and nothing else almost there was almost nothing else yeah. there was a box a kind of a white kind of a white uh a white box on stage just sort of poles so the way like a like a um what do you call those beds that like a, a, a kind of bed that Four poster, uh, exactly a four poster, yeah. but, but not, but not with the bed, just the four poster bed. Right. And in this, it was like a cube, a white cube. I'm, I'm channeling a memory back to about 1970 <laughs> or so. Be, stay with me. Um, but it was, it was a, it was a game changer, because it, it basically said, you know, you can do this with Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah. You can say, wait a minute, I don't need all that stuff. Let's focus on the text and on the characters, and let's make the characters come forward even more and and what i love about it is that it trusts the audience's intelligence yep. and it trusts the audience to it trusts their capacity to listen and it trusts their capacity to be emotionally engaged with what's going on i wonder if that is that is the essence of the problem with society receiving shakespeare today the way we're spoon fed by media conglomerates not trusting us to be able to uh, like disseminate through what the important stuff is. I mean, the classic example is you know they've got new TVs coming out, 4K TVs, 8K TV. I always say I would rather watch a crappy old version of the best movie ever than the the best looking, best special effects you know of the worst movie ever. It's the storyline that <laughs> you know what I mean. I don't care about an 8K yeah. TV if the story is shit. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense <laughs> at all. Uh, and even even on some, not to blow our own horns here, but even on some level, what we're trying to do in this in this broadcast is this is inspired by going to TVNZ, clicking on a news item, and having a seven second video clip hmm. to support the news item. And I was like, no, I can, I, I want more than seven seconds. You know, I can handle more than seven seconds. And that's what kind of actually literally is what started what we're doing here. Because it's like, I I think it's a disservice to the public that whether it be a television station or a news outlet or maybe even a band and that sort of thing, saying this is all you guys can handle right now. You can't handle any more than this, so we're going to decide for you. And I wonder if we want the we need more the ability to be trusted ourselves as to what we like, what we think is good, what we decide is, is important. And that's... I mean, maybe that's part of the reason that we're um, we're losing Shakespeare. Shakespeare, in a way, is uh, maybe Exhibit A in why live theater is so incredibly great because it it's not spoon fed. Once you're in that room, once you're in that dark room, because Shakespeare's plays. And the Globe Theatre plays, at least, were performed outdoors during mm. daylight. Mm. So there, you couldn't have. And there were no really no. There were no special. 
really no special effects. I mean, you could have some rumble in the background to make the sound of thunder, and you could have instruments that would play um, <clears throat> bits of music or trumpets and so forth, but you didn't have curtain. You had no curtain, you had no real set, you had may have a few pieces of furniture. You really had to trust the audience. The audience could do things, <sighs> I'm, I am in awe of an audience in Shakespeare's day. These didn't, people did not have, for the most part, they would not have had anything close to the kinds of education we all take for granted. Yeah, um, They did not have the printed texts in front of them. Mm -hmm. They couldn't pick up the paperback in the lobby and then skim or look at the program to get a plot summary. They didn't have those things. People, did, people spoke very quickly and the audience would be able to follow. Maybe they couldn't follow everything, but we can't follow everything yeah. in a live performance. But there's something wonderful about the the uh, 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 about engaging this live thing that's happening in front of them in daylight. Um, you know, if you were playing the ghost of uh, you're playing old Hamlet. What, what could you do as a ghost? Mm. They could put some flour on your face or some other kind of whitening material to make you look dead, maybe put flour in your hair. Um, but that's it. And the audience would accept, in fact, the audience probably um, believed in ghosts, worried about spirits coming right. back from the dead. And those things made that experience of watching a Hamlet even more uh, more vivid. Am I, am I right? And um, I've always understood that the language of Shakespeare it gets described as the language of the street. So we hear Shakespeare today, and we think, "Gosh, that that upper class language." But in the time, it was more the language of the I don't know middle to lower class languages of the street. If that is the case, mm -hmm. and maybe it's not, it would be easier for someone to sit in the round and listen and, and because it was the words they were using whereas for us to do that because it feels like 400 year old language it's more difficult it's it's a uh, i think it's a tricky situation you've got two kinds of language in shakespeare's plays you have poetry of mm -hmm. which which is what we think of when we think of shakespeare but then there's all the prose all the prose dialogues iago has uh this the the, the longest role in shakespeare is hamlet <laughs> The second longest role in Shakespeare is Iago in Othello, and Iago has lots and lots of speeches in prose. And my sense is that the prose speeches are much closer to, as it were, ordinary mm -hmm. language. I can't imagine that people walked around in iambic pentameter, and I can't do this on, on the spur, but just sort of coming up with, with uh, lovely iambic pentameter lines as they spoke to one another. Right. They, that didn't happen. Um, and yet, today, the prose speeches are often the toughest ones for us to 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 get because right. there's there are expressions there are turns of phrase there are ways in which the characters bounce off of one another and sometimes that material gets trimmed if not cut because it's just hard to convey all that to to an audience the poetry by and large is always kept I and mean, there are there are exceptions um but um I would say that Shakespeare's plays, as we understand them, um, build from the language of the street right. and the language of the court and the language of other poets and the language of other playwrights. I mean, he is a he is um, he. I, I think he is an omnivorous writer. He ate everything. <laughs> he ate the vegetables. He ate the meat. He ate the language from the street. He ate the language he heard from other. Playwrights. He read Hollinshed's Chronicles, which were written in English. We're not entirely certain how much French or Latin or Italian he might have had or didn't have, but we know that some of the plays are based on texts that he might have seen in translation, he might have had someone else help him with, or he might have read in another language. But um, uh, the guy used everything. Yeah, and used it very, very quickly. I am, um, Jace. I mean, you'll you'll know this, but I thought we could bring it up. Jace, can you Google uh, words invented by Shakespeare? <laughs> because the other thing I was thinking is, you know, someone is uh, sitting in the Globe, four hundred years ago, watching Romeo and Juliet for the first time, or whatever it might be, and he brings up within the context of the play, <coughs> there are words that are used that he's invented 
that no one's ever heard before. How does the like swagger? Great oh, word. I like, I like that. <coughs> great so. word. I just saw that at the same time you're reading it. Swagger's Shakespearean. Lackluster. You know, um, elbow as a verb. So I like to elbow someone out of the way. Um, how would the audience have responded to words that either as an elbow were getting used in a new context or maybe were brand new words like lackluster? What would they have done if they've never even heard the word before? Well, that's the actor's job. Yeah. So the actor, I, th I think, you know, if you were playing the character and you needed to elbow somebody, you would probably make your elbow go this way yep. and someone's going to say, wait, what did he just do? What did he just say? That word... People would know what a lot what luster meant, mm -hmm. and lackluster would be right. like. Uh, let's say uh, you you use the word lack veneer, or lack varnish. You yep. lack varnish, you. Yes. Yeah, we just invented a Shakespearean word. So I think that kind of um, building on things people know yep. uh, would have happened. But it's always the actor. The actor can figure out, and they didn't have directors. That's the other thing. The actors did they, stuff. Just they didn't have they, directors. They didn't have directors. Not really. No, there were playwrights and yeah. there were actors. I and mean, the director gets invented quite a quite a long way after Shakespeare. So, off. in the time of Shakespeare, Shakespeare was the person running the uh, the show. It could have been Shakespeare. It could have been someone else. He was part owner of the company. He was most important writer for. But that if company. it was someone else, yeah. wouldn't that person be considered to be the role of a director? Yeah. Well, as far as we know, no one had that kind of. All right, we're going to have a tech rehearsal. Right. I'm going to do the blocking for the show. Right. And by the way, Judy, just bring it down a little bit when you have your interest. And of course, Judy would be played by a boy. Well, that's the other thing. I mean, not to jump all over the place, but even though there's this, uh, you know, mythological movie that we were talking about before of Shakespeare and right. Love. Yeah. You know, I was watching it. With, I've got a 15 year old who loves Shakespeare. Um, she was very excited to hear about our conversation this morning. <laughs> but you know, talking to my girls when we were watching it yeah. about you know like boys yep. would play girls that's right going into a conversation not because they had to but when my dad was at an all boys boarding school right. in the 1950s right. not that they had to in that era right but you know it was something that wasn't as uncommon as you yeah. think and in, in their shows boys played girls sometimes and so there's interesting conversations to come from those things as well absolutely i went to an old i went to an old boys college um it went co-ed about a decade later, but... Um, yeah, just missed out. Yeah, just missed out. <laughs> um, but the... Uh, um, yeah, the, the convention, we, 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 we struggle with it. Um, but it's not just not just Shakespeare, all the Greek plays. There were no women on the Greek uh, in the ancient Greek well, plays. Well, it's also, it's interesting, I'm interested by the Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. That's all a ma an all-male all male. role. It's all-male, yeah. Because originally it was an all-male role, but it was men... Male, playing playing female women. characters exactly right. So I wonder how that translates to it still is men playing the female role, but right. actually as a man. Right. Can, you, can you imagine? Can you? Well, I can kind of imagine the what would happen in the US if some really big theatre company did a male production of Romeo and Juliet, but it wasn't a man playing a woman. It was just a man. Juliet was was male and so it was a homosexual relationship. Can you imagine the outrage? Well, and, but, you know. but that's kind of what that what this this yeah. the, the small film is. Um where it's it and it's very low key. It's it's not it's it it's it's a very, very low key film. I've only seen part of it. But it's oh, really? it's um I think it's on video, um or, or on YouTube, which is where where one accesses a lot of material. <laughs> um the uh the question of the the boy actor is really tough. When I when I teach Shakespeare, my students who have not seen Shakespeare are, are fascinated by this because I think kind of everybody is. How could that possibly work? Mm -hmm. And you realize once you begin to think of the characters as performed by um, young men, um, it makes it much more formal because you're you're not. You're separating out the way you would imagine a young man and a young woman in a romantic scene. And it pushes everything back on the language. Yeah. It's not about, you know, it's not about hot embraces. It's, it, it makes much more cerebral, much more intellectual. And again, trusting the audience. It's, it, it says, okay, let's just concentrate on how important language is in terms of romance, in terms of sex, in terms of jealousy, 
and how that language uh, in Shakespeare's plays, but maybe also in real life, allows us to get deeper into somebody mm. other than just the hot kiss, because Shakespeare's <laughs> plays are rarely about the hot kiss. Yeah. For, for a lot of reasons, including the fact that the actors are, 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 are men. Would there have been, because uh, in that era, obviously, um, you know, a male-male relationship uh, would have been pretty much looked down on. I know that there's evidence of, 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 you know, within war and, you know, whether you're a soldier and that sort of thing. But in general society, it would have been looked down on. In fact, I think I talked to my daughters about this as well. I don't know the answer to it. Is how would that have been received by the community when it's when it's pretend on stage? Was it was it still a, like like for example the not passionate kiss? Would there still have been a kiss or an embrace, or would the formality of the this everyone knows even though it's pretend that this is still to men mm. that that would have been not a part of this the show on stage? That's a good question. I I don't know how they would have been received, or or, or rather we don't we have no evidence in the written record of people saying, I went to the theater and I saw two guys kissing and that two I was, I was two blokes kissing or however they would have said that yeah. in 1600 and said, like uh, and said, uh, blimey. Um, no, we, we, we don't have that kind of a, a, a documentary record, but then they, or they would have already have had the tradition of the Greek plays and the Roman plays, yeah. tragedies of Seneca that would be performed in colleges and universities and the Greek plays, in which all the characters were, would have been played by by young men. There would be no you know, no women would be on the stage. And um, uh, mind you, there, there as you know, there there's there's not a lot of passionate kissing and romance in Greek tragedy. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, they would have been familiar with having uh, um, male performers performing as uh, as women. And I think it probably was quite. It had a certain degree of distanced formality right. of a kind that we might have found just as weird as what we think of as quote cross-dressing i have a little trouble with that term for this for this kind of uh, theatrical experience it's almost like it's that um it's the the live version of that fourth wall that's on the other side we accept it if that relationship was to come into the stalls where we're watching it maybe not quite so much yeah, it would be it would be slightly problematic. I think. Shakespeare, um, I don't know too much about his life as an, his, as an individual. You hear about various artists, various writers kind of dying as paupers. And Was he a rock star of the era? Was, was he known? Was he a, 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 a big celebrity? He did very well. Um, people, a celebrity in the sense that people were jealous of him. We have some early evidence of other writers saying he was, a, one writer called him an upstart crow. <laughs> that was sort of the famous wisecrack about, about um, uh, this young William Shakespeare guy. Um, he, he was born in 1564. His father was a successful glover. He was a glove maker um, in Markshire. Um, there he, we know that he married a slightly older woman we have we don't have any records of his school uh in of his schooling in stratford upon avon but we know it's we likely went to school there there's a few years when we don't really know where he was he might have been traveling but he did he did very well financially he was a successful landowner he was um he owned several properties i think there is some evidence that he was uh, involved in uh, hoarding of grain, uh, right. um, so he he doesn't get gold stars for every every aspect of of human that, behavior. What well, that was seen as a, a, a as bad thing. Yeah, it was a kind of there. There was a, you know uh, yeah he yeah. he may have he may have been as greedy as other mortals. <laughs> uh, uh, he had three three children and a son named Hamnet, and Hamnet, which is it, it, Hamnet, died. Um, and um, people make a great deal of the fact that he had a son named Hamlet and writes a play called Hamlet. And Hamlet and Hamlet are almost in, almost exchangeable, interchangeable sounds and names. Um, we don't know a lot about him, but the thing is, we the little that we know, and we know he was involved in certain lawsuits and so forth, and we have his signatures on, I think, six documents, um, we may or may not have one page of manuscript in his hand for a play called uh, St. Thomas More. Um, 
we have no manuscripts of any of his plays. There are, and there are, there's nothing, and that's not unusual for the period. And that's the other thing we we don't know a lot about Shakespeare's life, but we know more about Shakespeare's life than we do about other people of the period. Right? Um, Is that because possibly he because he was successful? <clears throat> In other words, if you weren't successful, if you did die a pauper. I mean, that we, person's not going to be written about. It would be very, very hard for us to, to know much about people for whom there is no written record. Yeah, yeah. There could be mentions of someone we don't have any other evidence for other than their mention in a text. So did he only have one child? He had three children. Is there a, is there a line that you can follow today? Like, do we know of his descendants? No, his, 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 uh, the, last, the last descendant dies, I think, Sometime at the end of the seventh, or in maybe the third quarter of the seventeenth century, the line doesn't ex- doesn't go to go on. Um, I'm I'm a little weak on the des- sure. on on the descent, um, but uh, um, no, I was just thinking of your comment, your question about uh, something you were saying about, and made me think more about: Is there anything that remains? There's nothing. We, people keep on hoping they're going to find things, and, and, and things may turn up. In fact, one of the most uh, exciting discoveries with Shakespeare of the last uh, week uh, has been um, uh, an article in The Guardian I read this morning, um, fairly convincing evidence that in Philadelphia, at, at, at an important library, a, an, uh, the anonymous, extensive anonymous uh, annotations on a copy of the first folio of Shakespeare are John Milton's, right. which would be, uh, if it can be further demonstrated, is, is huge. Um, and I'm, I'm sure over the next several years there'll be a lot of work on done on this one particular copy. But you know, Shakespeare had nothing to do with the with the first folio of Shakespeare. Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare was dead. He had been dead for. But he, you, you, it's interesting that there's not much written in his written. Um, no, nothing hand. in his handwriting. We, we have a what few signatures. We have a few signatures, and that's it. That's a picture of Mr. Milton. Um, because if you're writing a play, I mean, like I think of the equivalent today. If you're writing a play or you're writing a story or a poem, right. you're typing it on your computer. And that day, <laughs> right. in that day and age, you would yeah. have written it down. Yeah. I'm sure he didn't just. Um, Gosh, the name, the word just jumped out of my head. We dictate. He wouldn't have dictated it to someone else. He would have written it himself. So to think of all those words that I imagine he wrote first drafts of in his hand, for there to be nothing is surprising to say the least. Well, paper, of course, was very, uh, paper or any sort of writing material, yeah. paper or parchment, uh, valuable. Yeah. So you used every possible scrap. You used the front, you used the back, you write on the sides. Sometimes um, you would, you could take pieces out of a, book a blank out of a book and use that um yeah things got thrown away um and uh this is this is a big leap big big leap so bear with me i teach at cooper union in new york city in the um 1860 abraham lincoln came and gave a famous speech yeah it was called the cooper union speech in which talks about a house divided against itself cannot stand and it was the speech that made him a national candidate and propelled him to the presidency so right. whenever anybody speaks in the great hall of the cooper union they are always reminded of the fact that abraham lincoln spoke here well one would think that the manuscript for that would exist yeah it got tossed got thrown in the wow. waste, got used for waste, it got thrown in the waste paper basket. We don't know what happened to the speech, but it doesn't exist. We have printed versions because the a transcription of that speech or a, a, a typesetting of something uh, showed up in the newspapers, I think, the next day or within the next week. So I figure if it, if it could happen for a national candidate of Abraham Lincoln's increasing, per, uh, yeah. increasing uh, prominence in 1860, um, it's less surprising that the work uh, 250, you know, 250 years earlier would have wound up in the trash. Yeah, yeah. I wonder going like today, you're almost going to have the problem magnified because say the William Shakespeare of today in 100 years time, people are going to be studying their work 
um, and they aren't going to be able to go to his old house and look behind the walls and find an old hard drive from his computer <laughs> because he sold that computer and wiped the hard drive and all of the manuscripts that he, the drafts he kept were all digital. He deleted them when he got a new computer and so there's that they don't exist because they're never physical to be to be lost or found that's so the though. same what they're saying about photographs and this you know and like up until they say 20 years ago everyone had a, a little container with their uh, negatives in it and that they're, they're now all stored everywhere but now everyone's got them on a hard drive oh hard drive crashes i've just lost six years with the photographs it's terrifying yeah it's completely terrifying i think i have seventy thousand emails on my Whoa! <laughs> because, and someone would say, "Why don't you clean them up?" I said, "I would need a year off yeah, yeah, yeah. to go through my emails to get rid of them all." Um, yeah. And as for photos, I know there are ten or fifteen thousand photos on my phone. And I, what am I doing with them all? Yeah, I, yeah. I can occasionally go find some and, thing. And then, and with the whole like you know William Shakespeare of today as well, you'd have to be a very presumptuous person to go, "Well, this is going to be needed for my museum." Right. So I'll make sure that I back this hard drive up in several places and send a copy on to make sure that the people that are writing my my biographers will have this work. You know, you'd have to be quite presumptuous to, you know, even if you did get to the point of being famous in your own life, right. you you know, that would take some time. And so the stuff you did when you were younger, you would be like, oh, I can't find that anymore. It doesn't exist. And so you know, it's a, it's 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 a grim comic observation because that's exactly where we are. The notion that we're going to be able to document things from this generation and the next generation is it's, it's, it's very almost, complicated it's almost an irony in that we overshare and document every aspect of our lives you know there'll be but more, don't save any of it but more photos <laughs> there'll be more photos and 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 ponderings and posts of what we're up to in our daily lives on the internet yeah. um so we're in, in that respect, there is more information about every single person on the planet today than there probably would be of, 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 even, of even Shakespeare for a single, such so a regular Joe. Sure. sure. Um, but that's not going to exist in a hundred years' time unless Facebook's Facebook status and Twitter's t all the tweets that are on the Twitter are all archived um, and kept. Well, but it's not even know. that. You know, you have a something happens with the sun and there's a massive sunspot and the electromagnetic field shoots across the planet yeah. and we're in the dark ages again big big EMP or the World War 3 nuclear holocaust from World War 3 wipes out all the data we're going to have no record of what happened before and even archaeologists won't be able to dig it up because it's not going to be physical I mean, it's interesting I mean it makes you kind of think <laughs> what, what is we've got a very <laughs> tangent here what right? is yeah. <laughs> so now we're talking about actually now speaking of Trump no we're not going to do that today are we <laughs> World War 3 I'll do it um, do spectate. you do you keep an eye uh, today on I was going to say the modern Shakespeare's. You know, like, are you interested in theatre today? Are you someone who kind of keeps an eye out, finds people you like, think, gosh, that's an that's a really interesting writer, author, playwright? I go to a lot of theatre. Yeah, I go to a lot of theatre. I live in New York. I'm, I'm in London at least once a year, and sometimes we'll go just to basically have a big theatre thing and see whatever we can see and, and pop back there's a lot there's a lot of new york and, and there's a lot of lo a lot of places i mean new york is is one place but there's so much theater in the world and there's a lot it's a lot that gets streamed or you have opportunities to see things through the through the internet um yeah i mean i i yeah, there i'm not sure how many more king lears i can see <laughs> i think you know it's such a grim play but there are certain plays that i'll go see pretty much any production of and there are some of the weird ones um, what about new writers that aren't doing like Shakespeare oh. but they're like making new plays like so in New Zealand there's uh, like actually even here in Dunedin Emily Duncan who's a local playwright right. do, you, do you keep an eye on that sort of the up and comers I mean I think about New Zealand I think about Tor Fraser and his work um, is it something that you'd have obviously um the guy Lee, oh, I can never get his name right. Lee Moran, Manuel Miranda. Yeah. With, with the way you know, with Hamilton and so forth. Right. I was right. also thinking again, not not to bring up South Park twice, but the Book of Mormon, that kind of stuff. I love the Book of Mormon. Oh, I'm so jealous <laughs> you've seen it. <laughs> I saw it when it was new, and I took my son, who was, um, I don't know how many years ago that was? Is it? Has it been up for ten years already? It feels as if we've always lived in the world <laughs> of of of, uh, of the Book of Mormon. Um, it's outrageous, but um, I I thought it was really brilliantly done. Um, I do. I have a lot of theater subscriptions in part because work is so complicated. Um, I'm very happy to go to a bunch of theater things and have basically those heads of company curate what the lists are going to be. So I'm always seeing stuff by new playwrights. Um, and some of those playwrights uh, are, you know, are really, really productive and you get a lot of work. How often do you come out of a new playwrights show yeah. and you go, 
I'm not saying you've literally thought this, but you kind of go, well, that could still be here in 400 years. Oh, I never, I never, it's funny, I don't think I've ever had that thought. And that's partly because I can't imagine what's going to be, if there'll be anything left in 400 years, <laughs> considering the mess we're making of the planet. Um, um, yeah. No. Or even not 400 I, I years, this one's that. got staying power. Well, staying power, absolutely. And I, there's something really exciting about seeing work by somebody who's in her or his 20s. And you say, wait a minute, this is not a one-trick pony. This is somebody who has got so much vitality and energy. I want to see what they do next. Yeah. And I want to be around long enough to see a lot of stuff they do. Have um, you, have you, have you um, backed the right horse? To, uh, have you gone to a, a, like a first play and gone... Oh, there's something there and then and then seeing them actually have commercial oh, success boy. and being I mean, like oh, I know how to pick them yeah <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I, I have that uh that um uh um, foresight yeah yeah also I, I I have occasionally had con uh conversations with people who were real investors which is crazy it's a terrible way to it's a terrible way to try to make money is putting money into theater but it's, i'm people i'm had, glad people do it but it you really have to have money to 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 risk well, that's, they're more, they're, that's why they refer to theater. more refer to them as patreon patrons rather than uh than than investors or angels <laughs> they're they're angels, yeah. referred to as angels they're not ex yeah. necessarily expecting to get it yeah. back no it's <laughs> it's 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 really it's it's a tough business. And I, I don't know what the costs are, are like here in New Zealand, but the costs in New York for putting theater on are so high. And you know that affects what you're going to do. You're going you're gonna to get more conservative stuff in the biggest houses because they know they have to get X number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I months. think one of the unfortunate things is, is, is not just the cost of putting something on, it's also the success from getting that paid back with, with audience. So we've had a theater down here um, gosh, the name of it just jumped out of my head. What just shut the down? The Globe? No, they just the, shut down over on... Oh, Fortune, sorry. Fortune. Fortune. And it's been around since the, I think, since the 70s. And just last year, finally called it quits. So it's gone. The theatre's now gone. And they've had auctions where they sold off all the gear. So it's gone, yeah, gone. Yeah, Someone yeah. can't come in to save it because, because they're putting on plays, which cost a certain amount, but then they were getting bums and seats. Can't do it. So it's, so it's gone. I would not know if you'd call it the best end of New Zealand culture but it's been around for 40 plus years right doesn't exist anymore right i mean the building does but the theater's closed down that's sad um we we have uh at home we have uh, the, uh shakespeare in the park which is funded by the city and it'll do two plays a season in the summer right. and it's all free although there are corporate sponsors are making it possible so those corporate people get kind of the fillet of the seats yeah uh, but it, it's it, Joe Joe Papp started it with the public theater oh yep. fifty years ago, and it's it's super important. I I there's something incredibly valuable about having free theater yep. that's in the public. Nobody has to worry about the cost of it, um, and that basically the society and and society's purse strings through the government see the value of having this communal experience totally. Um, and also, uh, once again, it's it's based on trusting the audience yep. and belief that trusting the audience is itself an act of value, um, which is why I think theater is so incredibly, incredibly powerful. Well, I think that one of the ways we get around that here in New Zealand, I'm not sure about all the universities, but I'm pretty sure Auckland University always does Shakespeare in the Park. Right. So then it's students good, good. doing it. So it's a, it's a way of getting that funding down. It also makes me think of, you know, there's a lot of talk at the moment in, the, in America about the cost of living and things like healthcare and that sort of thing. Whereas in countries like New Zealand, we have a lot of that paid for through our taxes. Right. How important it is also to support the arts. Right. I guess from our small place, yes. being New Zealand, that a lot of our arts wouldn't survive without public funding. Right. We have a system here called New Zealand On Air, NZ On Air. And if you have a look at everything from music videos to movies to television shows, you'll often get the NZ On Air logo coming up right. because we have a population base of you know, four and a half million. Right. If you get a 1% hit, it's not very many people to pay for your product versus a 1% hit in the US, right. which is what, three and a half million people sort of thing. So the importance of, of having publicly funded art right theater um is super important um 
in America is uh, you're talking about sort of patrons and you know people supporting the arts. What about government agencies? What about local body authorities? Do those sorts of people get involved? Well, um, they do, but there's less opportunity. There are cuts everywhere in the United States um, under our unfortunate. Uh, he who he who will not be named in this yeah, podcast. Exactly, he will not be named. Uh, <laughs> Voldemort. The 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 uh, the National Endowment uh, for the Humanities, National Endowment for the Arts, um, have budget cuts and very little um, capability for supporting this kind of work. Um, we have um, <clears throat> state by state and community by community decision making in terms of what monies will support. Um, the arts. Um, I think it's unfortunate that we are as depend. We are increasingly dependent upon corporate sponsorship and mm. uh, individual patronage um, because um, I, th- I think that's not the best way to organize. Sure. Good for society. Um, I and mean, if something is commercially viable and it pays for itself, then it has longevity. That's right. I mean, if you're if you're relying on sponsors and you know angel investors at some point unless there are bill gates that well dries up right and um yeah yeah we have uh we have a lot of billionaires and what they do with their money um will vary from person to person and foundation to foundation but in terms of of theater I, I on the there there is a bright side i think and it's not um a bright side as a function of these complexities is that there's a lot of small theater yeah. And sometimes that is incredibly exciting to see just people in a basement working on stuff and coming right at you with it. And you say, what just happened? I, I, that's kind of my favorite thing is to come out of a small production and say, what did I just see? <laughs> what just happened in that room? Um, you know, I, I, I love watching great actors and in, in formal productions and and and. Uh, Anyway, I'm interested in opera. I like to see really big stuff, but I also like to see really small things because the opportunity there is for uh, a kind of vividness and risk taking mm. that reminds you why you want to go to the theater anyway. Um, it's interesting. Maybe, maybe on some levels, what I hear you saying is, if there's less of a risk of blowback, like without the big commercial concerns, there's more of an opportunity to push boundaries and break rules i think they're probably i think that's probably true and there are i've never been to the edinburgh festival for example in in scotland the fringe festival you mean? yeah, yeah. That, that, and well the you know it's it's huge yeah. it's just enormous and friends go and would say well you know you go to the theater one after another after another in these small venues it's three o'clock in the morning you've just come out of some pub where you've just seen something perform for 15 people and uh, and that's the sixth thing you've seen since lunch <laughs> Uh, it sounds really, really exciting, and I kind of I wish we had something that worked exactly on that model. Um, to my knowledge, we don't. We have other kinds of we have lots of festivals. I'm not, New York is not poor for theater, but there's there's a, a an electricity about having it in that kind of a um, specific location and at a specific time. It's sort of like the Olympics, really. Who, who was it? Was it somebody we had on? Was it Nathan or was it Ben? They're talking about the being at the fringe or the and they Ben's doing it, man. They've been here, like. and and they're talking about they did a show at one o'clock in the morning or something like that, and they had two people when they started their show, and by the end of the show there was nobody left, and so when the one person that was left got up and left, he was like, "Are you, are you going?" I think, was it Ben? I feel like <laughs> I'm, I'm maybe not sure. maybe it was I don't, don't want to sure. say that was Ben because but, yeah. it implies he's got like no early, one watching. Early, it. early, early, very early on was great, <laughs> maybe, but, yeah. but there was somebody I think told the story on this podcast potentially that though yeah there was what two people and then one person and when that person one person got up and left he's like. What do I do? And the sound guy was left, and the sound guy was like, "You know, that's you." But it sounds like Edinburgh's on the on the bucket list, as they say, for you. I would like to do it sometime. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. We, we've, um, but I, I would say of the story about the man and the two people. That's when you know you're an actor. Yeah, true. You know, what do you do? Everyone's left. Am I going to finish this scene? Or, or the contrary, the, the, the nobody's showed up yet. Do I start and right. hope people arrive? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. That's that's kind of terrifying. Hey, well, listen, Bill, um, I'm very thankful that you came in because you are you have a short window in New Zealand. So if you were to give us an hour of your time, we'd really appreciate it. 
It's something I've been looking forward to ever since we connected on the internet. It's been a blast. <laughs> this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And look, I'm I'm so stoked you came in. Um, it's just been a good time. Why don't we tell people again, if they do pick up on this podcast, we're obviously live at the moment. Hopefully we're still live. We haven't dropped out again. And um, Or if they pick up on it in the next 24 hours, you are at the... Scroll up a bit so we can see the actual dates and times. There we uh, go. At the right. University of Dunedin, Otago University. Um, 5.30, that's tomorrow... Uh, in the Moot Court, tenth floor, Richardson Building, and that's speaking about the the, the connection to opera. And right, Shakespeare's operatic life. Nice. And if people want to find out more about you and what you do, Let what can me. they do? Well, what do you they, think can, they can Google. Well, let's you? see. Do I, if we can? Can you scroll up? Scroll. Uh, sure. Have we, we, we given anything on here? We haven't. Okay. I I teach at Cooper Union. I think. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, what can I tell them? Here we go. There we are. That's me. Is there a URL up there? Uh, uh, amenities slash yeah. people slash William Jumana. That's pretty much it. Yeah, I write books for my sins. Is that a is that an okay um you know, people talk about the <laughs> writing of books being sort of something that's dead at the moment there's been no money in it is it a bit different in academia because well, there's a there's a different need for books and for publishing yeah i mean a lot of the books we write in academia are for you know for they're for it's all acts of piety because <laughs> there's not any <laughs> no money is going to exchange hands um i try to write books that people need um and then i in, in once in a while i write something that i just do as a kind of labor of love but i started as a publisher so i have some creds as um uh, uh, I guess an expert um, and I have two books and I have a couple more coming and eventually there will be a book on Shakespeare and opera but it's not going to be finished this year. So you're currently working on it? I, I'm working on it. I have a book coming out on teaching. Uh, it'll be out next year that I've co-written with Kit Nichols, my colleague and I have a book on you're going to laugh. A book on how to revise writing, which I've been revising for about three years. Uh, because that's the hardest subject of all. And then the book on Shakespeare and opera is kind of a, a, a lifelong... Uh, it's, I haven't been writing it all my life, but it, it's a book that has given me the opportunity to reflect on a lot of questions having to do with uh, Shakespeare and uh, operatic theater, um, which is something I love. Yeah. Well, again, thank you for coming in. When you release your book and you do a world tour on the back of it, you need to come back and see us. Absolutely. And we'll talk about it then. Great. William Germano, thank you so much for coming in. As we say, people want to catch up with you at um, Otago Uni. Uh, as we're broadcasting this live, it's tomorrow afternoon. That's right. Thanks again.